been painted later. We have repainted it several times. Yeah. Yeah. It's all the way on board. You'll notice how some of us are standing on a bit of a lower platform. I'm on this elevated part right here. This is the original floor height of the U-boat, so not a lot of headroom for the sailors back in the day. You can step on board just a little bit more for us. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Welcome everybody on board the U-505. At any point, if somebody needs a breath of fresh air, you can step out at any time. It's no big deal. This room that we're standing in right now, this was the petty officer's quarters. Some of the higher ranking sailors got to sleep in here. And if you were lucky enough to be a petty officer, you got a few nice perks, including your very own personal bunk and a small screen for privacy. Not everybody had it so good. If we take a look through that circular hatch in the front of the room, we can see the forward torpedo room, also where the lowest ranking men would have to sleep. Now there's only 35 bunks for all 59 sailors on board. That meant some of them had to share in a process called hot bunking or hot racking. That meant as soon as one sailor would wake up to begin his day, another sailor who was ready to go to bed would have to jump right back in. It was still hot, still sweaty, and usually lice-infested bunk that was left behind. Now, you boats like this would actually spend most of the time way up at the surface of the ocean. They would only start diving under the water if they were trying to run away from an enemy ship or sneak attack an enemy ship. In just a moment here, I'm going to flick a switch, and we are going to simulate a sneak attack on a British supply vessel. Let's see if we can get that started right here. Perfect. Right now, we're hearing the dive bells. Once those dive bells sounded, it meant the ballast tanks on the outside of the U-boat would open up and begin to fill with water. Those ballast tanks being full of water made the U-505 so heavy and dense that it started to sink down under the water. Once hidden in the ocean, the German captain and his senior officers would calculate the firing solution to find out where to shoot the torpedoes. That's what we're hearing right now. The word we're listening for right now is LOS. L-O-S. LOS. In German, that means away or fire in regards to that torpedo. for the crew of the U-boat. That's because bubbles that were given away by the torpedo might reveal the U-505's location. On that day, however, the Germans had done their math correctly. They were able to sink a British supply vessel. The men on board the U-505 could hear that supply ship's hull being crushed by the water pressure as it began to sink down into the Atlantic Ocean. The U-boats were quite effective in World War II. Just this U-boat, just the U-505 alone, was able to sink eight Allied vessels. Uh, a total of 53 members of the Merchant Marines were killed on board those ships. A we'll wrap-up we're looking at in the Petty Officer's Quarters. On the next stop of today's tour, we're going to see the control room. However, I'd like us all to see a few things on the way there. For example, underneath my feet, you can see the electric batteries. Now, these were used to power up the electric motors. We'll see those on the final stop of today's tour. The very first room that we're going to be walking by, on your left, that would be the galley or kitchen. That kitchen is where one cook would make three meals a day for all 59 sailors on board. If you can imagine that, in that tiny space there, I want you to think about that as you walk by. Past that, another bunk room, more officers could sleep in there. And then finally, past that on your right, you're going to see the captain's quarters, where the third and final German captain who served on this U-boat his name was Captain Harold Longa. That's where he got to sleep. I know that's a lot to see. And we only have about 90 seconds to see it all. A minute and a half before I continue the tour in the control room. Everybody, please stay to the right and follow me. Thank you all.
I noticed a few of us have to duck as we enter this room. I should mention that the German captain, Longa, was about six foot three. It's about 190 centimeters tall. We're all gonna file on board a little bit more. I wanna make sure we're filling up all the available space. We got a big tour group here today. Control room that we're in right now. Most of the controls for steering to boat around are kept in this room here. This is a gray box over there on the wall. It's labeled BBC, and that is the Helmsman Station that had electric control of the rudders in the back of U-boat. So control the side to side movement to U505. And again, I want to make sure we're all filing in here. There's still some space up front. We're all gonna get the authentic U-boat experience here today, everybody. We're all gonna get to know each other in this room here. Fantastic. Now U-boats like this were not designed for all out combat against large groups of enemy warships. So, on June 4th of 1944, when one of the Germans spotted five American destroyers and an aircraft carrier coming towards them, the German captain knew the only way to survive would be diving the U-boat into the ocean and trying to hide from the Americans. To do that, he sounded the emergency crash dive bells. What those emergency crash dive bells meant is that all men who were not on duty would have to run to the front of the U-boat and then dogpile on top of each other up there. All that added weight in the front of the U-505 helped it sink even faster. And if everything was done right, the U-boat could be under the water in about 37 seconds. Once hidden in the ocean, the Germans could only speak in a whisper. That's because they could hear the Americans up above, listening in with active sonar to find out where the U-boat was hiding. Do we all hear those pinging noises right now? That's the sound of the Americans using sonar to listen in. Instead of loudly shouting orders across the U-boat, German officers would whisper into tubes like the ones we see over here that would carry their voices through some of the pipes above our heads to other parts of the U-boat. That helped the Germans remain quiet, even though they were still communicating with each other. Also, the captain sent all of his men, who were not on duty, to go to bed. It was hoped that a sleeping man would make less noise and breathe less air than one who was awake and working. Once the U-505 was under the water, they had just 36 hours of breathable oxygen before they would have to head back up to the surface. Those sonar pings were becoming louder and faster, which meant the Americans were closing in. We're gonna hear Captain Longa order the U-505 to dive even deeper. As the U-505 sank down to 500 feet beneath the waves, the men on board could hear the increasing water pressure threaten to crush the U-boat. But even worse than that sound would be the sound of splashes. That would indicate an American depth charge attack or bombing attack. Once the Germans heard those splashes, they knew they only had seconds to hold on for dear life. As explosions rocked the U-505, all electric control systems were knocked offline. Also, one of the rudders in the back of the U-boat became jammed. That sent the U-505 spinning down further and further into the ocean. If it were reached 750 feet beneath the waves, that was the crush depth of the U-boat when the water pressure became so great that it would completely destroy the U-505, all of the men on board. 
Luckily for the Germans, they still had control of the ballast, or the buoyancy of the U-boat. They were able to vent that ballast out and make the U-505 light enough to spin all the way back up to the surface of the ocean, which is right where the Americans were waiting. Once back on the surface, the German captain took his senior officers up the ladder here to see what was going on around them, and the Americans began shooting at them for six minutes. During that time, one of the German officers, the radio man, was killed by the American gunfire. That was the only death on this U-boat during its capture. The surviving Germans came back down the ladder here. The captain ordered all of his men to abandon ship. But before they left, they wanted to scuttle the U-boat or sink it on purpose. That way, the Americans couldn't capture any of the secret information or technology on board. So to do that, one of the Germans reached down and he opened up something called the sea strainer. The sea strainer is a pipe that leads right down into the ocean. Once that pipe was opened up, it let seawater start gushing out and flooding the U-boat, speeding up how fast it was sinking. And once that was opened up, all of the Germans abandoned ship. The American captain, Captain Daniel Gallery, sent in a boarding party of nine American sailors down this ladder to try to salvage or save the U-boat. One of those Americans was lucky enough to find the lid to the sea strainer, and he was able to seal that back up. That stopped the water from entering the U-boat and prevented it from sinking on that day. The rest of the Americans headed to the back of the U-505, and that'll be our next stop today as well, the electric motor room. If everybody here could do me a big favor, and as you exit this room, look on the floor to your left. Again, that's going to be this way on the floor to your left as you walk out of this room, and that's where you can actually see the sea strainer that was opened up to sink the U-boat. Again, everyone, please stay to the right. Follow me. Thank you all. I'll be heading back this way. Sorry about this, sir. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Perfect. Folks already right down there. Thank you. The sea strainer and the lid down next to it. I'm just thinking it's like a wall. Yeah, that's right. cylinder 2200 horsepower diesel engines in that room and when they were going at full blast in such a tiny enclosed space it really heated this part of the U-boat. That's why the diesel engine room, this room here as well, the electric motor room, need to be the two hottest rooms on board at about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 47 or so degrees Celsius. If we all take a look down beside the floor there, does everybody see that long gray cylinder shape next to the floor? That's one of the electric motors. Yeah, you're tapping it with your foot right there. The other one is located down beside the floor there. Those are both the electric motors on board. If anybody got a chance to see the electric batteries earlier in the tour, that's what was used to power these up. All right, as I mentioned, one of the Americans was able to seal that sea strainer up, stop the water from entering the U-boat. The rest of the Americans headed back here. They were looking to get through this hatch and into the aft torpedo room, another torpedo room way in the back of the U-boat. However, this hatch was sealed shut. That worried the Americans. They figured the Germans booby-trapped this hatch with explosives before they left, and that those explosives might go off if this was opened up. Wondering what to do, the Americans called in their captain, Daniel Gallery, for further orders. Captain Gallery entered the U-boat, ordered all of his men to step out of the room and into safety, and he took what must have been a very deep breath, and he swore over the hatch. Fortunately for the Americans, the hatch here was 
not rigged with explosives. Instead, they made a few interesting discoveries when they flung this open, including the fact that the Germans painted key parts of the U-boat, like this area here, with a sort of glow-in-the-dark radioactive paint. That way, if the electricity was ever knocked offline, like it had been on that day, there'd still be a little bit of light to walk around the U-boat by. I want to assure everybody here that this is not the original radioactive paint. We made sure to grind all of that off and replace it with the dollar store glow in the dark paint mm -hmm. that you need the UV light to activate today. So no worries there, everybody. You're oh, not in any danger. The Americans headed into the aft torpedo room, and inside of this room, they were able to find and fix the manual controls for the rudder. That's what stopped the U-boat from spinning. And then the U-505 was towed all the way back to Bermuda, and they spent the rest of World War II there. We'll talk about that a bit more when we finish up the tour outside together in just a moment. In the meantime, if anybody wants, feel free to stick only your head through the hatch here, and you can check out the aft torpedo room and the larger of the two bathrooms that the Germans could use there on the left of the checkered floor. 59 men had two bathrooms to share, and this is the big bathroom that you see there on your left. That floor in there is hollow and fragile. I don't want anybody here to become a permanent part of history, so please hang out on this side of the hatch. And I'm actually going to sneak behind you folks over here and open up our other watertight hatch. And wait for you folks outside to have the Q&A section and wrap up the tour as well. Bathroom, okay. Let's go to the bathroom. 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 The bathroom is small. It's a bug. 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 Chidi room with him. Ah, pray. One twenty degrees Fahrenheit, which is next to uh, fifty degrees, yeah, forty eight degrees Celsius. Prototype Type 21, uh, how do you say, electric motor. Type 21 German U boat electric motor. This is a Type 9, and it had a Type 21 electric motor on board, which is unusual. Um, and so the Americans were able to study that motor and find out the uh, limitations of the type new, brand new Type 21 German U boat. So that was another valuable piece of intel that the Americans got out of the U 505 here. Also, a couple Enigma machines. Anybody here familiar with those? Yeah, two Enigma machines captured on board the U 505 here. And we still have one in the uh, exhibit. We still have one of the ones that was from the U 505 here. So you'll see that in a little bit. Yeah. These are all great questions. I'm actually going to have to hold on to that until we get to the bottom of the stairs down there. I'll be wrapping up the tour at the base of the stairs down there. That gives us all a little bit more room. This is the uh, electric motor room. What you walked back there was the diesel engine room. Second? The diesel engine room? Diesel engine room. That's what you're smelling, oh. diesel fuel. From yes, yes, so, yes. You are right. This, this, right. Is for this is one of the ballast tanks for water. Oh. Yeah, this is actually one of those areas right here. Okay. Cut through here. I need to... Yeah, yeah. Four candies for the seven on each side of you. Inside of the room. Is it over? Uh, not quite. I'll be uh, doing the Q&A session at the bottom of the stairs down there. We're all going to All right, so the Americans, after fixing the port rudder, which is the one closer to us over on that side of the U-boat there, uh, that stopped the U-boat from spinning. And then the U-505 was towed all the way to a British naval base in Bermuda, and it spent the rest of uh, World War II there, being studied by the Americans and by the British intelligence forces. As for the 58 surviving German crew members, they were tossed into a prisoner of war camp in Ruston, Louisiana. They spent the rest of the war there, working on a farm and playing baseball. As far as POW camps go in World War II, that one was not bad. However, the Americans wanted to keep the capture of the U-505 a complete secret from the German government. 
so they did not allow those sailors to contact the Red Cross or even their families to let them know they were still alive. That was a violation of the Geneva Conventions by the Americans. When Germany surrendered in 1945, those sailors got to go back home. Although the process took a little while, about a year and a half, it was early 1947 when the final German sailor returned from the U.S. back home to Germany. However, uh, after the war ended, some of those German sailors actually decided to move from Germany back over to the United States. They lived the rest of their lives over here. One of them in particular, his name was uh, Hans Gobler, he lived here in Chicago. And during the 50s and 60s, when this U-boat was still outside, he would walk around the U-505 talking with guests about his first-hand experiences on board, which is pretty neat. We have some information about him out in the exhibit. You guys will see that later on uh, as we continue on. Uh, the U-505 was then donated to the Museum of Science and Industry in 1954. We've had it ever since, although it did spend 50 years sitting outside on the east lawn of the museum. It was out there from 1954 all the way until 2004. Do we have any Chicago natives on my tour today or anybody from the uh, Midwest even? Yeah, we got some people here. You know how much rain, sleet, and snow we get? Yeah, yeah. So if you can imagine something metal like this sitting outside in that rain, sleet, and snow for 50 years, we're going to do a number on it. Do we all see how bumpy the outside of the U-505 is, how rough it is? That is from the 3,200 pounds of rust that we had to grind off of the U-boat before we moved it indoors in 2004. How we did that is we got underneath the U-505 using hydraulic lifts, and then we picked up the whole thing from underneath. It weighed about 693 tons. We then moved it down into a massive empty hole and built the exhibit that we're standing in right now all around it once we had it down in here. The U-505 remains here today as a war memorial for all of the American men and women and members of the merchant marines who lost their lives in the Atlantic Ocean in World War II. That does wrap up my tour. If anybody has any questions for me, that would be awesome. I'll be hanging out in this area for a while just to answer those questions. But otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day here at the museum. Thank you for your time today, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should, no, he answered my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where, where did they dispose all the waste? How much was everything? Just down to the sea. They did have a, uh, a small holding container for the toilets, uh, and when you were on the surface of the ocean, you could actually flush those toilets. But you had to be careful. If you're diving underneath the water, you tried to flush those. The water pressure would instead force all of that waste back up into the U-boat. That was really gross. They didn't want to do that. But yeah, all the garbage and all the waste that they had, they would just dump on the board. Oh. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.